Within a decade of its invention, the safety bicycle had swept the world, even to the wastes of Alaska. I've trotted, I've starved, and I'm frozen all over this white barren land. While the sea stretches straight, white and silent, while the mountain timberless stand. It was the 1890s, and across this landscape, a thousand miles from Nome to Dawson City, came the men of the Klondike Gold Rush. They came by bicycle, solid-tired, heavy machines bowling up frozen rivers, the prospector's best friend. And when the going got tough, still better than a frost-bitten horse. Safety bicycle is an English invention. Just possibly, the concept could have been Leonardo da Vinci's or one of his pupils. This doodle was discovered among da Vinci's manuscripts. In 3D with animation, it's for all the world the bicycle, a drawing from the 1490s, 400 years before the safety. This sketch could be a chain, a three-speed gear, ball bearings. Renaissance technology could have built it. But the first working bike wouldn't emerge until 1817 with the German, Baron Karl von Dreis and his running machine. There were no pedals. The rider just pushed against the ground. But it did have steering, the trick which made the running machine rideable. Von Dreis had discovered balance. The bike was born. The world must know. First to France to demonstrate to the Parisians in the Luxembourg Gardens. But the rider von Dreis had sent from Germany failed the big occasion. <laughs> Public relations fiasco. <laughs> Nevertheless, the bicycling Baron of Baden survived. So too his idea, which took Europe and America by storm. Sadly for him, the design was easily copied and patents ignored. Meanwhile, the wealthy and the fashionable had their fun. Riding schools abounded. Two wheels impressed the ladies. But these spills and thrills were for the leisured. Workers merely watched. Or perhaps forged new ideas in their smithies. Kirkpatrick Macmillan, village blacksmith of Dumfrieshire, Scotland, did just that. He fitted the basic Dreisian running machine with treadles. It was 1840. The world had its first pedal bicycle. Macmillan promptly rode to Glasgow, where, according to a newspaper report, he was prosecuted for knocking over a child. He was surrounded by a large crowd attracted by the novelty of the machine. The child who was thrown down did not sustain any injury, and under the circumstances, the offender was fined only five shillings. 
This invention will not supersede the railway. Nor did it, for steam was the preoccupation of the day. Britain was seized by railway mania. Macmillan's was the right idea at the wrong time. The right time was in 1861 in France. This was the Velocipede. The Velo caught on fast, first commercially produced by Pierre Michaud in Paris. By 1865, Michaud had made 400 machines. Five years later, when he sold out, production was up to 200 a day. And for the first time, women were cycling. In France, they even raced. And for gentlemen, a new spectator sport. For some women, at least, the velo had brought progress, if not emancipation. For the world, Michaud had unleashed a passion. Everywhere there were riding halls, entertainments. The things got so out of hand in New York that cycling was banned in Central Park. And in the countryside, a velo still caused shock and resentment. Okay, the fucking off. Such was the case in the Netherlands shortly before the Franco-Prussian War. Velocipeda Charles Buzivan, former editor of the Algemeen Handelsblad, was bombarded with coal. It had been thrown with full force by a fellow on a passing towboat. I had to be thankful that the perpetrator missed my head. Scare you weg op je rotmachine. But greater hostilities were at hand. The Prussians had invaded France. Paris was besieged. And as bikes were beaten into guns, the French velocipede industry vanished overnight. It was 1870. The initiative was about to pass to the Anglo-Saxons. England was still in the afterglow of the Industrial Revolution. The city of Coventry had slumped, its silk weaving collapsed. Labour was cheap and workshops eager for new enterprise. Thus did the Coventry Machinists Company augment sewing machine production with bicycles, French-style bellows. This memorial is to the works foreman, the man who was to make Coventry and the whole British industry the bicycle workshop of the world, James Starley mechanical genius. Starley reasoned that speed was governed by the size of the front wheel. The bigger the wheel, the further the progress at each turn of the pedals. Starley also knew how bad were roads. With mud and potholes, the bigger the wheel, the better the ride. In hindsight, the next design was obvious. The day of the high wheeler had dawned, and with it, bicycle clubs for men. Hampton Court, London, 1882. 
Like cavalrymen, they were answering the call of the Pickwick Bicycle Club. wheels that had grown as high as a rider's leg would allow, the Pickwick Club led off. This was the biggest procession of high wheelers the world would ever see. Nearly 2,200 riders stretching six miles. And there, just for the fun of it. Quasi military in style, the club offered security and mutual protection. For in the countryside, people still threw stones. Britain had well over 500 clubs, each with its own bugle call, each with a uniform. Here, the London Bicycle Club. But high wheeling was a dangerous game. Starley had designed a wondrous wheel, but never try breaking its speed. The problem was the header. And here was an American remedy. Reverse the wheels, put the small one at the front, and place the rider's weight over the big one at the rear. This way, man and machine safely descended the steps of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., a publicity stunt of 1881. The high wheeler remained the plaything of the young, sporting, and middle classes. In England, artisans and mechanics were banned by some clubs from amateur racing, the Times of London. Their muscular practice is held to give them unfair advantage over more delicately nurtured competitors. But the high wheeler didn't entirely hog the road. For the older and less athletic, for doctors and clergymen, for women in skirts, there emerged the tricycle. A circular from Britain's Bicycle Touring Club to its tricycling members acknowledged their gentility. It is desired by most tricyclists to separate themselves entirely from the bicyclists, who are a disgrace to the pastime. While tricycling includes princes, princesses, dukes, earls, there are none of the upper classes who ride bicycles. Again, the inventiveness of James Starley had been at work. Coventry's tricycle trade was booming when Starley died in 1881. But the great wheel had had its day. This is the kangaroo of 1884, with a much smaller front wheel. The reason is gearing. The change from the large cog drives the small cog. Clever, but better still. Switch the chain to drive the back wheel, and there's the classic design, the safety bike. 1885 and the Rover, the safety bike which set the fashion to the world. Its designer, John Kemp Starley, nephew of James Starley. The Rover was dubbed the safety bike because it was just that. With the pedals off the front wheel, no more scuffed legs as the rider steered into a bend. Touch the brake and no fear of a header. This was cycling as it should be, safe, speedy, available to all.
The problem was how to publicize the new machine. The answer was the Rover Road Race. Okay. Paced by high wheelers, 14 men raced 100 miles through southeast England. What's the call out? The route was kept secret to the last minute. Police were liable to ban such events. But the publicity did the trick. The rover was embraced by the world. To this day, rower is the Polish word for bicycle. And rover's still in business as the Rover Car Company. Starley's Rover wasn't the only safety. How about these treadles with their echoes of Kirkpatrick Macmillan? Or this lightweight cross frame? Too elegant to really catch on. And here, some nifty suspension above the front fork. Anything for a smoother ride. But the problem of road resistance will be properly solved in Ireland. A boy called Dunlop was having trouble riding the cobbles of Belfast. His father, a Scots veterinary surgeon, had a bright idea, inspired, they say, by the intestines of animals. He developed the pneumatic tyre. His son and all cyclists would ride on air. The year was 1888. A global manufacturing dynasty had been founded in the name of John Boyd Dunlop. But Dunlop's tyres were merely glued to the wheel. Three years later in France, this man came up with an improvement. Edouard Michelin, father of another industrial giant. Michelin developed a tyre which could be easily detached from the wheel and easily repaired. The modern bicycle was complete. The first thing that made me think this could be big was the fact that uh, the guy down the street, who had never been into bikes before, got on one of these bikes, went up in these hills, and was sold. The mountain bike, a hundred years of cycle technology turned on its head. A design so marketable, it warrants expensive television advertising. Chunky, fat tired, go anywhere. In Europe and North America, outselling everything else on two wheels. The worldwide uh, proliferation of mountain bikes has made me very, very happy. It's the, it's the happiest, uh, you know, business thing or, you know, sport thing. It's one of the happiest things of my life going, for sure, because. Uh, 
to see bi people enjoying bikes in more ways. Uh, that's something I always wanted. Gary Fisher, West Coast hippie turned mountain bike business chief. The man who rebuilt the bicycle took it up a dirt track and launched a dream. Here he is with Charlie Kelly in the 70s, co-leaders of a pack of dedicated bike bums in Marin County, Northern California. Go! They raced clunkers downhill and put their faith in the hub brake. You're on it so much that it's just pouring smoke out of it. I mean, all the grease, in the, I, I kid you not, all the grease is just turned into vapor, you know, and it's just pouring out the back. It looks like you're riding a 250 Yamaha with bum rings, you know. All the grease is gone. It's vaporized, and then you got to go home and repack your hug. And they called the race the repack. Gary Fisher. They were doing this uh, coming down the mountain on old single-speed Schwinn's and Colson's, and I went on a couple of rides with them, and I started laughing again. It was, like, hilarious. Basically, what made a clunker was these wide tires that would absorb a lot of shock and uh, these heavy rims that would uh, take the abuse. The braking system, which consisted of motorcycle brake levers and motorcycle brake cables and tandem brakes. And uh, the derailleur system, which had extra low gears for going up those steep, steep hills, uh, 15 speed. And uh, the frame, which uh, was a very stable geometry and had uh, the clearances for these big wide tires. Clunkers were cannibalized from solid old American roadsters. As a bike shop mechanic, Fisher was the inventor, the road tester. Kelly, as a rock group roadie, hunted components on his travels with the band. Really, these old original clunkers for us were a lot of found pieces. No one was really taking us seriously. Uh, they genuinely thought we were out of our minds making these big boy BMX bikes. Come on, you guys, I want you to keep it loud enough so you can't hear a word I say. The BMX had emerged from California in the late 70s, a hit with youngsters around the world. Yeah! But its popularity was short-lived. Today, the BMX is more a display sport than a mass hobby. No way! The mountain bike has been more resilient. Fisher and Kelly thought up the name and introduced the first production prototype at the 1981 New York Bike Show. The Japanese snapped it up. Today, in affluent markets, the mountain bike accounts for up to 45% of sales. Although his partnership with Kelly soon broke up, Fisher is still in business, still inventing. The mountain bike is one of the most explosive change markets uh, around. Uh, you know, uh, there's very little limit and there's lots of new things coming out every year. This bike I'm riding here, it's a, you know, has front and rear full suspension and it's, you know, just opened up a different way of riding, a different type of smoothness. And this is a first generation. There'll be many generations to come. The appeal of the mountain bike is its strength, its low gearing, its user friendliness. But the bike's chief asset, the off-road capability, is causing problems, especially in America. Erosion. And in many areas, hikers and equestrians don't like sharing trails with cyclists. The growth of the mountain bike may have peaked. The land access problem has already inhibited the growth somewhat. The conflict of interest problem will be solved by good management. Uh, the mountain bike is a new entity and needs to be uh, learned about by all the m different management people. And then they need to um, keep us some places, keep uh, hikers other places, and have some things that are multi-use. And I think everybody will get along. But there's a new kid on the block, still tough and sporty, but lighter for town. It's called the hybrid, a cross between a traditional tourer and the mountain bike. It has the style of the mountain bike without its over-engineering, 
at mud guards, and it's possibly what most cyclists are looking for. This is a new design. A fundamental rethink of the structure of the bicycle, the work of engineer Mike Burrows. Perhaps another Gary Fisher? A single piece of bonded carbon fiber does away with the tube frame. The front wheel spokes are aerodynamically cast to reduce drag. And the wing-like handlebars cut air resistance by a factor of 10. Light as a feather, the wheels are attached on single cantilevers. And as with the pedals and chain, everything is held together on one cohesive unit called the monocoque. This is a very advanced and superior design. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find designs of this sort proliferating in the racing world. But racing doesn't seem to me to be the natural ecological niche of a bicycle. A high-technology bicycle like this seems to be out of the mainstream of the important social uses of a bicycle. For ordinary use, I don't think it really points the way to the future. But if the Far East gets interested, Mike Burroughs could be a millionaire. David Jones is a science consultant to industry. In analyzing basic bicycle design, he's worked out what makes a bike rideable. If you look at an ordinary bicycle, the steering axis hits the ground slightly ahead of where the front wheel touches, and that's significant because it gives the bike a little bit of stability, not too much, because then it's hard to ride. But if you turn the front wheel round, and I've adapted this bicycle to make it possible, now the steering axis hits the ground well ahead of where the front wheel touches. That makes this bicycle very stable. So stable, it'll go on forever. But even with handlebars, an awkward ride. Which is why practical bikes have forward curving front forks, a compromise between stability and rideability. The bicycle wheel, too, is a tried and tested design. Spokes are an elegant combination of lightness and strength. For the faster the wheel turns, the heavier its inertia. A gram saved on the wheel is worth a kilo off the frame. Early wheels were built of wooden struts, a heavy, compressed structure. The spokes, which hold the wheel in suspension, make it lighter. And tangent spokes make it stronger, forming triangles, the strongest geometric construction. Brake design has always been a problem. Whether hub, disc, or a new caliper like this, a truly reliable brake has yet to be engineered. Gears are a different story. This is Sturmy Archer, maker of the world's best-loved three-speed hub. A century-old design fitted to 80 million utility bikes and reliable because the gears are protected within the hub. Hub gears are easy to shift, simple to maintain. But they dissipate a lot of the rider's power and there's too big a jump between gears. By contrast, the derailleur is an exposed gear system. Invented by Tullio Campagnola in 1933, it's crude engineering that can work like a dream. Modern thumb shifts take a rider through a score of finely indexed gears. Sophistication which is up to 99% efficient at transmitting power to the rear wheel. But gears, wheels and frames are mere tinkerings to a bicycle design which dates from 1885. Two kilograms, can you hold that steady please? David Jones is checking the calibrations of a wind tunnel. Two kilograms gives us a nice 40. It's by tackling the aerodynamics of machine and rider that engineers believe bicycle design will be fundamentally improved. There we went, very nice 80, that's 40 newtons. The efficiency of different bikes is being tested at 20 miles an hour. 
wind speed is checked against the distance traveled by a polystyrene chip in 1 50th of a second. The tunnel is deemed accurate. Least efficient is the high wheeler, with the rider offering a lot of resistance. Observe how that uh, stream is breaking up around the back of his head. He's obviously a vortex now. Little better, the traditional roadster. 75 on the meter, a drag of 3.8 kilos. The sports bike is much better. I'd expect higher than that, actually. 38, two kilos of drag. There's not as much, not as much drag on, on this, the speed as the speed guest. And with a racing model, a marginal improvement. It gets better the lower the rider crouches, down to 1.7 kilos. And drag can be shaved a fraction more to 1.65 kilos with a racing helmet, and to 1.6 kilos with aerodynamic handlebars. But nothing tested so far can match this reading at over twice the wind speed. This is the Bean, possibly the most aerodynamically efficient bicycle ever built, designed to chase speed records with its low, super sleek profile. Then you get a major improvement. That was giving us only, of the order, 0.6 of a kilogram at 45 miles an hour speed, which scaled down to 20s, only about 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.15 kilograms. So that's a major advantage, but at the cost of a totally impractical vehicle. Unlike the Bean, these machines are made for practicality. Pedal tricycles enclosed in carbon fiber fairings. They're ridden in a semi-recumbent position, like a child's pedal car. A Danish invention called the Lytra, good for commuting and touring, and with a payload for shopping. The brainchild of engineer Carl Rasmussen. The Lytra is a mobile overcoat, offering protection from the weather, snappy dogs, and the splashes of bigger vehicles. It's nippy, too and light enough to be carried out of traffic jams. Carl Rasmussen commutes thousands of kilometers a year, even through heavy snow. Winchester, Massachusetts, and a recumbent built for two. David Gordon Wilson weekend shopping with his wife and spending significantly less energy than riding a conventional tandem. The recumbent, Gordon Wilson believes, is the bicycle of the future. But it's a design of the past, never catching on despite possibly 25% less drag than a conventional roadster. Recumbents have been introduced into the bicycling scene in the 1880s, the 1890s, the 1900s, and so on, on and on. And in the 30s, a particularly successful recumbent was uh, uh, pedaled by a second-class racer in France and beat the world champion over many distances. The records didn't stand. The recumbent was ruled not a bicycle. Bye-bye, sweetie. Rain, hail, or storm, Gordon Wilson commutes the eight miles to work on his solo recumbent. It only seems unusual because of the almost dead uniformity of the regular bicycle. Its adherents think that it has so many advantages that it will eventually take over. I think there's been a lack of development because of the dead hand of regulation. And when that has uh, had the power to, to rule out pretty well any development, the result was bicycle companies became extremely conservative. So no adventurous engineer ever went to work for a bike company. Gordon Wilson teaches mechanical engineering at MIT. He developed jet engines for Boeing. Would that bicycle engineering have the thrust of the big battalions? Oh, it's mouthwatering to think what might happen if you had NASA or General Motors working on a bicycle. The shape of things to come. The recumbent. Today, the speediest in bicycle design. Once it's got a fairing round, then the combination of a low frontal area and a streamlined shape that gives something near the optimum for a streamlined body, which is a length diameter ratio of about four and a half or five, it happens to fit rather well. So that's why it gets up to its very high speed. One of my 
modified track racing bicycle in there. These are the annual speed championships of the International Human Powered Vehicle Association. 77 Supernatural, 13.7 for Supernatural, a top speed of 65 miles per hour. This is Gold Rush, the fastest bicycle on Earth. 65.4 miles per hour from the muscles of a human being. It's intriguing to uh, think that the body, therefore, is, is an engine. But it isn't, because if it were, the second law of thermodynamics would say that to, to develop that uh, efficiency, the uh, temperature within your body would have to be uh, hundreds of degrees Celsius. And we know it isn't. So therefore, the body is a kind of fuel cell. Go! And the bicycle is the most efficient means of converting the output of that fuel cell into locomotion. These championships sprang from an idea by David Gordon Wilson. He wanted to recreate the competition and enterprise of the late 19th century, the atmosphere which gave birth to the safety bike. Free to the narrow design rules and politics of international bike racing, these races demand innovation. And one day, the big idea. You can imagine being able to wiggle your ears and having a little mechanism, getting your power output from that, and, and doing this sort of thing, and, and wiggling your arms. Uh, but uh, the evidence at the moment seems to indicate that if you did all that, if you, if you trained all the muscles in your body to twitch, and you had uh, magnificent machines that uh, collected all this energy, your heart and lungs would be overloaded. So uh, my guess is that uh, the legs are a good match, and the legs and the arms are probably better. But beyond that, that's probably too much. Why not a water bike? A $25,000 prize awaits the first craft to reach 20 knots. Another for the first human-powered helicopter. For cycling, the sky's the limit. This is the greatest road show on earth. A fiesta, a celebration of man and his noblest invention, the pedal bicycle. The Tour de France. There are some days when you get a good story, you've seen a good day's race, beautiful countryside, and you think they shouldn't pay you to do this. And we'll be very happy with an, an American or an Italian, we'll be very happy. We like the best win. Nous voyons des millions de spectateurs tous les jours. Et ça, des millions de spectateurs voient Coca-Cola. Ça, pour nous, c'est très important. The tour where French Elan has turned the humble bike into the biggest mobile circus in the world. When you come here and you see the people on the road and you see the importance of the race, uh, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I want to win this race. Two hundred riders, three relentless weeks, four thousand kilometers of suffering. A stride mechanical perfection. The last advance in technology that everyone understood. Born of the running machine. Nurtured by the high wheeler. Matured with the safety bike. Greg Lamond, the ultimate tactician. 
and his acolytes, the Z Team, sponsored by a French children's clothing chain. Le Mans defends the cyclists' crown of crowns. You have to put up with a lot of attacks from top athletes, pressure of not only the team, pressure of yourself to try to win, pressure of the journalists, spectators, everybody wants an autograph, everybody wants five minutes. It gets very difficult to, to do the physical and the mental thing together for three weeks straight. Le Monde has already seen off Laurent Fignon of France, twice a tour winner and last year's runner-up. They are actually witnessing the retirement from the Tour de France of Laurent Fignon, and once he was in the car, he hid his face behind a newspaper and refused to give any interviews. It's 1990. Again, the Tour has more drama, sharper focus than any bicycle race in the world. Jan Carlson, 24 years old, his first Tour de Trump. Took first place in the 1989 Scandinavian Championships in the team time trial. The latest imitation is American, a tour dreamt up by a basketball commentator. He just thought that there should be an American version of the Tour de France. He scribbled something down on a napkin. He dreamed up a name, the Tour de Trump, and he went in to Donald Trump and said, what do you think of this idea? We'll call it the Tour de Trump. Trump laughed and said, come on, that's ridiculous. And then 10 seconds later, he said, sure, that's a good idea. Trump was still ahead of the game in 1989. The Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City had yet to threaten his property empire. Hotels, an airline, next a bike race. Trump became main sponsor. The Tour de France is a hard act to follow. Trump had a hundred competitors chasing prizes of a quarter of a million dollars. But the US had no tradition of long distance racing and organization was poor. By the year two, 1990, the profile of the Trump had barely cleared the horizon. 11 days around the East Coast, this was no tour of America. But it was an airing for Greg LeMond, badly out of condition just two months before the Tour de France. If New York had virtually ignored this stage finish in Central Park, then the media did the same to the Trump leaders. All eyes were on the American hero twice winner of the Tour de France, currently 85th in the Trump. Uh, but it's been a great race for training, this race, and I think four days of recuperation in the Tour of Italy. Uh, it's what I need to get in shape for the Tour de France. Not the best publicity for the Trump, but where was the sponsor? Donald was far too busy fighting for his financial life. The finish in Boston. After 1,100 miles, a winner from Mexico. He did it for this. The winner's check, $50,000. Le Monde was an hour and 40 minutes behind. Like the Trump, the Tour de France sprang from a thirst for publicity. It was launched by one daily cycling paper to upstage its rival. At issue was a Dreyfus affair. A clearly innocent Jewish army officer had been convicted of spying. The anti-Dreyfus journal dreamt up the tour as a campaign promotion. The date, 1903. Nine decades later, and still the world's top cycling event. Pyrenees. Overnight, thousands had driven to vantage points for this, the 16th stage, the climb to Luzardi Den. Being here is being French. An election in July would be unthinkable. The only votes are for champions, daubed lovingly on the tarmac. It's relaxed, it's civilized. 
and here's the caravan, an hour ahead of the riders. For many, it's the anticipation, the carnival of caravan publicitaire, which is the best entertainment of all. These are the commercials. A sponsor's car can cost 600,000 francs. The riders are on their way, and sensational news. Greg Lamond is in the lead. Laid low by a virus early in the season, no wins since the last tour, Lamond is back. To date, he's never won a stage. His trick is to be fast enough in each stage to win the tour on an overall timing. And way behind, the tactics of the peloton. Pacers and shielders who've given their all to thrust stars like Le Mans to the front. For the leaders, it's just man against heat, gravity, utter fatigue. It can be too much. This was the English rider, Tommy Simpson, in 1967. He collapsed a kilometre short of the summit on Mont Ventoux. It had been his seventh Tour de France. Simpson was 29 and believed he could win. He'd once come sixth. Popular in France, more so in Belgium, Simpson's mentor had been Albert Burek, a cafe owner in Ghent. Burek looked after several British riders. I was at a race in France, um, in Belgium, an amateur race. And I was watching the race, and the, tele um, the tour was on television in front of a shop window. And people say to me, it's an accident. I met Tom Simpson. I went to look in the window, and I heard the commentator saying they just took Tom Simpson away in a helicopter. And they said he was very bad, but they couldn't say what it was. So I didn't watch the end of the race. There were so many English lads there, but they weren't too far. There was about 20 miles away from here. And that was about, I think, four o'clock afternoon sometime. And the race wasn't finished until six o'clock. I say to the other English lads, tell him I'm going home to have to cycle home tonight. I, I, can't, I want to know what's happening to Tom. So I drove home, and by the time I came home, my mum was sitting there in a the chair crying. My armchair, and she told me Tom died, and I just collapsed. The post-mortem revealed traces of amphetamines. At the restaurant, Burek was dismayed that drugs had been cited as a possible contributory cause of death. But he had once been pressed for stimulants by another of his races and refused. And he asked me to give him something. And he kept insisting in the morning, I said, all right, I'll give you something. Come to see me in the morning, I said, on Saturday morning. He was racing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I gave him just an injection of, what do you call it, uh, vit vitamins, B12. He didn't know what it was, though. And he won the race. He thought he took something, but he took nothing. He just took vitamins. As Greg Lamont forces his way through a corridor of people. Since Simpson's death, drug checks in the tour have become progressively tighter. And that might annoy Greg. It might even inspire him to take the stage as well. As Lamond is forced into second place at the Luzardi Den summit, there's still the question as to whether a rider would take stimulants to enhance his performance. No, no drugs, no drugs. Uh, Greg absolutely does not take drugs, does not even like to have injections, vitamin injections. In the last 10 years, I've seen the sport uh, clean up, and uh, uh, the, the riders are all for very strict drug controls. Nobody wants to uh, hurt their health uh, competing in a, in a sport. It's already a hard enough sport, and who knows if it's even really healthy. It's a mass media event. Commentators and competitors chatter to the world. Can Le Mans pull it off for the third time? 27 networks are bouncing TV pictures to 60 million viewers. The Colombians are at fever pitch. The networks pay a fortune for the coverage, vital income, 
for the Tour de France must be big and commercial or die. The major thing about the Tour de France now, because it's become an emblem of France, but it's now what the French wanted, what they call it mondialisation. They wanted to bring the Tour de France worldwide. And that's just what they've done. A thousand journalists all pushing out the word, all well disposed to the Tour. And like Sam Apps of the Herald Tribune, who can complain? With Le Mans now lying second overall, it's a cracking story. In the Tour de Trump, he had nothing, he had no legs, he had no stamina, he suffered dreadfully. And two months later, here he is, doing wonderfully at it. Um, so it's a total change. He's in it for the glory, he's in it for the satisfaction of winning races, but he does like to make money. And he's making $5.5 million over three years in his contract with Zed. And there are many American athletes who make much more than that. He wants to be paid comparably to other American athletes, and that's how he's revolutionized the sport. The Americans have come to Paris. Le Monde as the man who raised all riders' fees a thousand percent. Coca-Cola as a new main sponsor. Le Tour de France est le troisième événement mondial et Coca-Cola doit être sur le Tour de France. Qu'est-ce qu'on donne sur le Tour de France 400 000 boîtes de 15 centilitres et 45 000 boîtes de 33 centilitres. 200 000 sacs plastiques, 100 000 casquettes. Et toujours des millions de sourires. Ça, c'est Coca-Cola. The tour needs an annual turnover of 60 million francs to keep it on the road. Coke alone is pumping in up to 18 million francs a year because of the tour's heightened international exposure. Nothing would better ensure renewal of the cola dollars than a third win for Le Monde. He won in 86, the first American ever, again in 89. Last night, Le Monde was leading on overall time. To clinch the tour, he must cross the line today within sight of the Paris stage winner. Johan Muzir has got the lead now, and the green jersey isn't too far away. The two great sprinters almost head to head, but Baffy is pushing hard too. But Johan Muzir is going to try and take this stage, and Baffy is trying so hard to get it for his father, but he's going to be beaten. Johan Muzir takes a life. Baffy is second. And there is the hand of the winner of the Tour de France. Greg Le Mans salutes the crowd for the third time. Still not a stage victory to his name, but who cares? Dad's done it again. The Zed girls are ecstatic. And up on the podium, Le Monde and Mayor Chirac have the limelight. But... Greg himself is a, is a nice guy, but... It, I think I don't. I, I kind of, I kind of don't like what he's doing to cycling at the moment. The Le Mans, I think, is a very, very great coureur. I can't say that he's like Merckx, because Merckx, Merckx, for me, is always the most great coureur that has come to the world, maybe. But Le Mans, he's a very great class, and he knows what he can do. The legendary Eddie Merckx won the Tour a record five times. Now he's swapped racing for business, and the competition is just as fierce. Merckx has a small factory in his native Belgium, producing exclusive racing bikes, and trading on his fame and a ruthless reputation for winning. Not just the Tour, but classic after classic. Because if Greg Le Monde wanted, he could do exactly the same thing and win a lot of victories. It's not normal that a champion du monde n'ait pas gagné une seule course jusqu'au Tour de France avec un meilleur champion du monde. Et ça, je crois que c'est la réalité et que Greg Le Monde ne veut pas voir la réalité et cherche des excuses pour se défendre ses propres torts qu'il a. Cycling has changed since he raced. Uh, it's much more competitive. We have much better trained athletes than he, when he raced. Uh, Eddie Merckx was always months in advance of everybody else because he trained through the winter. And uh, I have people who race with him, and they, they, there's no comparison. We have maybe 10 Eddie Merckxes in the peloton right now. 
Je crois que lorsqu'on a le maillot de champion du monde sous les épaules, on a une certaine responsabilité vis-à-vis -vis de ses sponsors, vis-à-vis -vis du, du métier qu'on exerce. Et je crois que Greg Lemon, cet hiver, a oublié qu'il était coureur cycliste et qu'il s'est mal préparé cet hiver. D'ailleurs, ça s'est vu dans... Euh, le début de saison où Greg Lemon était vraiment nulle part et je trouve ça absolument dommage pour un garçon tel que Greg Lemon qui est certainement le plus, gra le plus grand talent actuel du cyclisme qui n'ait pas plus de respect pour son métier, c'est tout. C'est purement de jealousy parce que je marque un bicycle dans les États-Unis qui a pris un petit bite dans sa compétition et il voudrait voir mon valeur ou mon nom pris un petit peu or my, my name taken down a little bit. And uh, to me, it's, it's sad to see a champion like that. Uh, uh, I really had a lot of respect for him uh, until I got to maybe know him a little bit better, and especially after his comments. Uh, I just say it's sad that uh, I hope when I stop cycling that I'll be kind enough to the young riders and the new generation that uh, I, I'll keep, if I have bad words or bad feelings, I'll keep them to myself. Le Monde may win nothing but the Tour de France, but that's the way he plans it. More than anyone, he's taken cycle racing into the financial big time. The Americanization of the Tour is complete. tomorrow's money spinners in the making. One in 11 gets in, no one drops out. The toughest, the most exclusive commercial academy in the East. The young hopefuls of Keirin, Japan's biggest and best in the business of bicycles. This is the Japan Bicycle Racing School. Students train as nowhere else. Ten months of drilling, scrutiny, analysis by camera. We may treat them like dogs, says the college principal. But next year they could be earning a fortune. These steely tutors are fueling an industry, the Japanese phenomenon of Keirin track racing. The Keirin school is financed by the racing industry for the racing industry. Each year, 150 graduates will qualify as professional Keirin racers. They'll be able to compete on Japan's 50 Keirin tracks. Superstars can earn up to a quarter of a million dollars a year. With such incentives, the rigors and self-discipline of the Keirin school will be understood. The stakes are astronomic. Riders at this race meeting have been isolated for three days to prevent nobbling. A billion yen might be waged at one track in one day. It's formal and strict. Nine riders per race, maybe ten races a day. A meet of up to six days. And nobody can ride more than once a day. The winner of this race could pocket well over a million yen. 75% of the betting goes as prizes, the rest to local government. These are the thoroughbreds, the greyhounds of Japan. Betting's closed. The 
hairs off, the riders spring their traps. Gently, tactically at first. There could be 30,000 in the velodrome, but it's quiet, almost disreputable. Many older Japanese shun caring because of its gambling connotations. The human hare paces the riders as they slipstream and plan their moves. The distance is 2,000 meters, five laps. With the pacer's work almost done, the thrill of Karen is about to unfold. The bell is the cue for the hare to peel off, the sprint to begin. Shoulder pads and helmets are no mere decoration. This is rough stuff. They are approaching 70 kilometers an hour. It's this that annually packs in 27 million spectators. And a finish like this. No wonder Kering can donate $20 billion a year to public works, just 11% of its betting turnover. Profits from Kairin helped rebuild post-war Japan, an era when he merged another great bicycle business, the Shimano Corporation. This is the founder's son, one of three brothers who turned a fishing tackle company into the most marketable name in bicycles. Shimano make components, more than half the world's derailleur gears, plus everything else that can be hung on a bike. There was certainly a period, uh, perhaps a year ago, two years ago, where the consumer was coming into a bicycle shop to buy a Shimano bike, meaning somebody else's bike with a Shimano group set on it. Shimano's success came with the mountain bike explosion. While rivals like Campagnola of Italy ignored it, Shimano embraced the mountain bike, creating set after set of stylish accessories. I think Campagnola were caught unawares by Shimano, certainly didn't anticipate the level of innovation that was coming out of Japan. Innovation that has meant robotized production in Osaka and tax advantages in Singapore, a joint venture in Italy and ever more chic components. The relentless pursuit of a dream by Shimano's designers. Oh, Shimano invest heavily in research and development. Listen to the voice of the market, they say. With good engineering and sharp marketing, they're the dominant force in world component supply. But Shimano have been a victim of their own success. Overwhelmed by orders, months late with deliveries. They've been unable to meet that demand. And therefore, they have been a difficult supplier to us, and they have interrupted our manufacture and our supply. It's absolutely unhealthy. It's unhealthy and it's very dangerous. And on the top of this, all the bicycles are going to look alike. So we have to be extremely careful. And as far as we are concerned, we are supporting uh, other component makers. Like Saxe Hura to France, but outside the factory with cyclists themselves, Shimano remains top choice. The corporation is well aware of the supply gap. Shimano realized quicker than most that the world is becoming a single bicycle market. The big manufacturers are transnational. The bike is no longer the product of one country. It's a buoyant trade. The North American market is worth $2 billion a year. Western Europe, twice as much. A point not lost on a pushy exporter such as Trek. 
But long gone are the days when a company like Rally of England had the British Empire as its market. We followed the flag, and therefore it was with uh, colony, dominion and commonwealth that our business was built up. After the 3945 war, we started to give our commonwealth countries independence. And the first thing they wanted to do was make bicycles. The result was devastation at the rally factories. Compounded by the rise of the car, Raleigh's workforce was slashed from 8,000 to less than 1,200 today. Nottingham was no longer the bicycle workshop of the world. My grandfather founded this company in 1895 as a middle-aged man who had immigrated from Germany. He was pretty well educated and worked for the Adler Corporation in Germany. And he came basically because he was fascinated with the most popular machine of the day, which was a bicycle. And for the best part of the 20th century, the name Schwinn has dominated the American market. Cheap, cheerful bikes, because Americans would rather spend money on automobiles. With quality not an issue, Schwinn began to move production to the cheap labor of the Far East. Chicago had once made a million bikes a year. Well, going by here, you know, I could just cry to think that what we are passing here was at one time perhaps the prestige bicycle factory in the world. Schwinn had moved here to the giant manufacturing company of Taiwan. This is the company chairman. Here, his office staff. And here, his factory workers. Disciplined and highly motivated, and compared with America, a very modest wage bill. Schwinn was back in profit. Giant had headier ambitions than making other people's bikes. Today, as Taiwan's biggest manufacturer, the company markets under its own name. In less than 20 years, Giant has joined the world league. Uh, I don't think we are more successful because uh, Taiwan only produces now 6 million uh, bikes uh, per year. Uh, Europe is producing more than 10 million, and US more than, more than 10 million. But I think the Taiwan industry has tried very hard and we are concentrated in what are called a new type of bicycles than the traditional one. These frames are carbon fiber, Giant's bold move into ultra lightweight design. The Kdex, as it's called, is expensive, but it could be a world beater. The manufacturing process is so secret it couldn't be filmed. Kdex was born of Giant's prodigious R&D department, confirming the company's move into the middle and upper market. This Taiwanese product is no longer cheap. Enthusiastic selling is to Europe, North America and the Pacific Rim. Giant still supply other manufacturers, chiefly specialized of California. But, apart from exercise bikes, the Schwinn deal is dead. In a quest to minimize costs for his cheap American market, Ed Schwinn has moved production to mainland China and Hungary. His pursuit of cheap labor could go on to India, even Africa. Giant have no such problem. With a low-cost workforce, average age 28, they're chasing the expensive Western European market. Bikes come off this production line more slowly because they're for Rotterdam, their specifications more rigorous than for elsewhere. Anthony Lowe believes in his staff and technology. We use a lot of a computer you know, for the total manufacturing integrations 
And we also have a lot of automations in the machine that may by itself. I think those things also help. Daily briefings keep staff informed. This is a mountain bike frame giant will make for specialized, engineering at which the Taiwanese have become so much better than the Americans. The order came from the packager and purveyor of quality bikes for America, Mike Signard, president of Specialized. I saw an incredible niche in the market. I, I couldn't believe that, that there weren't more quality uh, bicycles available. You know, I was keenly involved in cycling and saw that there was really a shortage of that kind of product or people really even addressing the market. Sinyard builds 150,000 bikes a year. Staff try out new models on lunchtime rides. They help us test them. If we make a product that doesn't work, the people in the company really let us know quickly. It is a, really a statement about the, the philosophy of the company in the sense that we make products for ourselves and that we can be very uh, tough critics about the products. So we're going to have the adjusters on this one? Yeah, it's got to have it. Sinyard has bucked the idea that Americans will only buy cheap machines. Essentially, specialized designs, then farms out production to good suppliers, and finally, assembles in California. Because this is just way too flimsy, so I think we should eliminate this tire. Specialized is also one of the world's biggest suppliers of water bottles and they make helmets, tires and shoes, a clearly defined brand image with global appeal. Which is more than can be said of Rally, a seemingly random collection of companies. In Germany alone, the conglomerate trades as Rally, as Rixer, and as Kalhoff. These bikes are from Rally of Holland. This from America. Even dealers are puzzled. Rally had sold off many of its overseas subsidiaries. Now, together with the parent company, they've been bought back, saved from years in the doldrums by an energetic holding company, Derby International. It's put a new uh, spirit into the whole business, into management and into the workforce. And finally, of course, it's invested very heavily in new methods. It's essentially a financial organization headed up by a couple of people who seem at the moment to be interested in bicycles. So much so that Persia was also on Derby's shopping list, but the deal fell through. The strategy behind this was very good. I think it was a good idea to concentrate big groups uh, uh, in the bicycle industry to fight against the importation from China, from Taiwan. Now, the uh, transaction has been extremely long, and at the end, the both group decided that it was so difficult to make the deal that they dropped it. It seems, on the face of it, that it fell through because Peugeot decided there was money in making bicycles. Even without Peugeot, Derby International's rally group has burgeoned to become the world's biggest bicycle manufacturer outside mainland China. But in the UK, where rally dominates in children's bikes, Derby hasn't fully benefited from the general market boom. And it's the same story for all home-based competitors of rally. It hasn't been British companies building more bikes to supply our market. It's been the Far East supplying more bikes to an expanded market. You're talking about the globalization of the bike industry. And it's a question of whether or not the big guys will get bigger and will the little guys go away. And I think almost neither is true. There will be a couple of big players in a global world in the next decade or two. I think we'll be one of them, and I think Derby out of England will be the other. We are number one in France, and usually we are number two uh, in the other countries in Europe. So we have different, uh, different competitors. Rally is a big competitor. And Rally's biggest competitor is mainland China. As a third world country, China is flooding Western Europe with cheap, well-produced bikes. They currently get in under the generalized system of preference or GSP regulations, which says because they're such a developing nation, they should be accorded this, this special benefit. They are the world's largest bicycle makers, making 40 million bicycles per annum. The labor cost in China is one-tenth of the cost of Europe. That's extremely important. And a few years ago, they were not producing 
so good qualities. But unfortunately, a lot of manufacturers, European manufacturers, have decided to transfer their know-how, their technical know-how, their marketing know-how. And then, from China, are coming good bicycles with very low prices. And if we want to keep the European industry uh, in good shape, we have to fight against this. As bike sales boom, Taiwan may have peaked, Europe and America fought back, and cheap production moved to China. The bicycle is now a global market. Consider how you can pinpoint the very day, the very hour, when you hit that first sweet spot and you became forever a cyclist. Words from Bob Rodale's Path to the Golden Wheel. I began thinking about the spiritual aspect of the bicycle shortly after we got the magazine bicycling because our readers, I found, were very mechanically oriented. They, they, they were preoccupied with the gears, the machines, the tires. They didn't have a language to talk among themselves about these special times, sweet spots, where uh, everything comes together. It just transforms you. The moments that make the pain, the sweat, the hard work seem trivial. And once hooked, your life may never be the same again. If you talk to somebody who's not a bicyclist, they may not be able to tell you, or they may reach only a couple sweet spots in their whole life. But a bicyclist has lots of them. I cycle every day. It's transportation for me. It's also my best philosophical time. Donna Wissinger plays classical flute on the international concert circuit. Virtuosity enhanced by the joy of cycling. I find my face just opens up. The breeze blowing past me takes away the wrinkles in my mind and in my face. And in that way, I'm better able to bring together ideas that make the music meaningful. From New York's Carnegie Hall to Paris, Graz, and Leningrad, Donna Wissinger is a consummate solo professional and serious amateur athlete. If I push myself to do, say, a time trial, and I need to find a way to cycle, for me, fast 19 or 20 miles an hour, I have to find the means to do that. It's the same skill that I have to use in music. If I need to do a recording and I have to push myself that extra distance, I've already acquired that skill through cycling. Beryl Burton, an English farm worker who for a quarter of a century has dominated women's cycling. Seven times world champion, with a daughter in tow, her husband Charlie as coach, and no financial rewards. Hers is a lifelong pursuit, an all-consuming passion for bicycling in the amateur race. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Dig in, battle. Half of my training was doing riding from work to home to get the dinner ready for them to eat. I used to just have a, a sandwich and a cup of tea, go training, and then come back and have my dinner afterwards. A grandmother now, Beryl Burton is still racing. I'm not on form at the moment. I haven't been for a couple of seasons. I've got to that age with females, this menopause problem. And uh, I'm not riding nowhere near as well as I should be doing, but I'm riding to my best ability. And yet I'm still beating people that are much younger than what I am. This is open road time trialling, racing against the watch. And Beryl is still outclassing men. A Frenchman wrote, where Beryl French, Joan of Arc would have come second. Whatever comes up, you, you sort of challenge it and you've got to be successful. 
football. I remember as a child playing ball in the backyard, just up, up to the wall. I used to set myself targets that I had to do it 20 times, and if I didn't do it, I used to get so distraught and bang the ball about, and I would carry on until I'd actually done what I, the target that I set myself at. So I must have been born with this killer, this uh, drive to be successful. People are still thrilled to beat me now. But that feel, to me, that feels wrong because I'm not getting faster, I'm going slower. So the thing is that they should be aiming for, to me, in my way of thinking, is to beat the records that I've set up. I mean, the 10 mile record is something like 17 years old. Santa Cruz, California, world headquarters of the Nomadic Research Labs, base for another bicycling obsessive. But being in the West Coast, a laid-back approach in more senses than one, a combination of high technology and beckoning horizons that have made Steve Roberts the world's first computer nomad. It occurred to me that uh, perhaps it ought to be possible to take all of my passions and combine them into a lifestyle. And I made a list of them. Travel, adventure, bicycling, computing, networking, ham radio, publishing, romance, fun, learning. And it became immediately obvious that the solution to all of my woes was to trash my lifestyle, get rid of the house, and pack everything that mattered to me onto a computerized recumbent bicycle and go wandering. Courtesy of the bike, suburban man turned easy rider with lots and lots of gadgets. Plus a partner, Maggie Victor, on a less encumbered machine. Maggie has been uh, my traveling companion now for about four years. She helps with a lot of the business details, uh, is the lifestyle maintenance manager, a uh, great companion, and now she's getting into photography and is the official trip photographer. It's worked. Steve Roberts has been making a living computing across America, writing it up on a word processor with a keyboard on the handlebars. I think the fact that, that this machine echoes people's dreams of freedom and adventure and getting away from it all is probably what's making the whole thing work. Because everywhere I go, I, I run into people who see what I'm doing, uh, respond at first with incredulity because of the, the complexity of the technology, talk to me for a few moments, recognize that my dreams are a lot like their dreams, and all of a sudden it's a demonstration that anything is possible if you're willing to take some risks. It's important that I be able to work on it wherever I am. So to do that, all the access panels that open up. It says four megabytes of RAM disk so that uh, I don't have to always be operating from a hard disk drive. Although it does have its own hard disk, this shock-mounted platform here contains two 40 megabyte hard disk drives. These devices here are, are uh, ultrasonic sensors. The console puts out a signal which these receive and there's a little controller in there that notices changes in head angle by looking at uh, phase and Doppler change. So it lets me control the cursor on the Macintosh simply by looking at where I want it to be. This is the inside of a Macintosh portable, and I've interfaced to it with fairly gently. Uh, I haven't had to hack into the board at all because all their interfaces to uh, the real world, including keyboard and so on, are all easy to emulate with my own hardware. This is a little solid-state refrigerator. This will generate about 50 watts of cold from excess solar panel, uh, solar power and things like that. So this will cool my drinking water and also actually pull heat out of my body by uh, with a little heat exchanger in the helmet. And incidentally, if I have a wreck, this is supposed to protect my head. So. I hope I haven't voided the warranty. One of the big challenges is to just see how much I can get on the bike, but it has to be stuff that fits. I don't want to just load it up with a lot of irrelevancies. For me, bicycle riding would be destroyed if I had to struggle around under a burden of heavy luggage. The whole idea is to fly as light as a bird across the surface of the, of the roads or the tracks or the deserts or the, or the snow fields that you're trying to, trying to cross. Nick Crane, the London writer who cycles the globe. He's biked up Kilimanjaro, conquered the High Atlas, and ridden to the centermost point of Asia. There are a few more extraordinary sensations than riding a virtually unloaded racing bike across the Gobi Desert with no luggage. You haven't got any food with you because you're just stopping a truck every, every day and asking if you can buy a bit of bread or, or buy some water or cold tea from me. You're completely dependent on things that you come across in the landscape. I found particularly in Africa where you go into a chai house or in Nepal, you'll find that it breaks the ice as you arrive. 
It's not like a, a metal and glass box that a car is, where you can conceal things and it's all rather suspicious. On a bicycle, you're completely open to them. They can pick up the bike, feel how light it is. They can get on the bike and ride around the village square. They can see that you're not hiding anything. It's just you and your bike. And the bike in the third world is very much an everyday tool. It's something that everybody knows and everybody uses. There's nothing mysterious about it. And also, you're, you're, you're therefore at, their, at, at the same level. An adventurer who never urges caution. Just common sense. Understand your companions, know and trust your bike. My idea of a great trip is to actually cut things down to an absolute minimum. One spanner with holes drilled in it to save weight, one tire lever, a machine for taking the chain apart with the handle taken off, a pair of goggles for riding in the desert with eye shades and a nose protector to stop the sun burning your nose, a pair of chopsticks here with slots cut in the handle to save weight. Chopsticks are much lighter than metal spoons, of course a spoke key with cut in half, and a watch, a lady's watch. Ladies' watch is much smaller than gentlemen's watch. Cut the lugs off and then tie it onto your trousers with a little piece of string, and then your girlfriend's photograph, a last plastered to the back of a credit card. So travel happily, travel light. Or if you're competing in the race across America, travel at night. This is Elaine Mariel, who set out to be the fastest woman over 3,000 miles, coast to coast. After I've been cycling for about a year, I went and did the qualifying race that was, it was 800 miles long, and I came in second, and I figured, well, since I qualified, I might as well go on and try to compete. In the first year, in 1984, I came in last place, and it took me about 14 days to do it, and um, I did it just on a wing and a prayer. And I remember sitting in Atlantic City uh, at the end of the race, kind of wondering to myself, I wonder if I can be competitive in this event. So over the course of the, the next two years, I worked on my training, nutrition, and my mental attitude, and went from last place to winning it in record time. She did it in 10 days, two hours, and four minutes. A time trial where the clock never stopped, even at night. Training for the Race Across America, you have to ride about 21 hours a day. Um, you cover between three and 400 miles a day, which means a lot of that's done at night. There's less traffic, the stars are out, it's cooler, but, you know, it's a sleepy time, so there's that uh, challenge of trying to stay awake. Elaine Mariel writes a cycling column for the San Francisco Chronicle, actively encouraging a sisterhood of cycling. Women are, are again, taking up the sport, and discovering the same sorts of things that yes they have muscles yes they work it's possible to push yourself and and the kinds of power that you feel when you're riding a bike are things that you can take and translate into other areas of your life whether it be work or profession or uh, you know a family Cologne Germany the International Bicycle Exhibition 1500 trade stands from 38 countries and on the prowl Richard Valentine Bicycle guru, seeker after truth. Valentine's is a magnificent obsession. If it's new, value for money, and it works, Valentine wants to know. An inflatable saddle from Campagnola. And this, the number of pumps that you give to the saddle depends on the weight of the racer. The idea is as the raise chain stays. A snazzy mountain bike from Cannondale. Valentine will listen, assess, and think. Obviously, has a suspension system here. Ideas, and more importantly, road tests that could well end up in a Valentine book. Titles which have made him the world's best known advocate and unashamed enthusiast of bicycles. The thing for me is that they're fun. And what I'm saying to people is you know, come on, give it a go uh, and see what suits you. Richard, if you just move your, your right foot back a bit. That's better. That's good. If you just move your shoulder under, from under, that's better. Valentine's first foray into writing was in the 70s. A Bible, an encyclopedia which was to motivate a whole new generation of cyclists. His latest offering is more for the coffee table, a meticulous celebration, his ultimate on the bicycle. Politics and concern for the environment don't get people on bikes, says Ballantyne. Okay. The motivation is fun, and people must be shown that it's fun. 
Okay, Colin. Yeah, get down a bit more, a bit more expression. Amid mediocrity and froth, Ballantyne writes with intelligence and showmanship. It's something worth doing well, which is kind of what this book is about. And you've got to kind of respect the reader and let them make their choices. Just give them the information they need so that they can do it. Like the data on the latest Moulton. Very light, very fast, very expensive. His affair with the bicycle began as a boy. His father gave him a bike after a bout of measles. As a young man in New York, a bicycle was the fastest way to get around. Based now in London, he keeps a stable of bikes, and he's forever road testing. They are the equivalent of having wings. They are the most efficient means of locomotion that you can possibly have. When I get a dream, it's kind of like the cars have evaporated, uh, freight is moved by rail and underground and things of this sort, and people have their own personal vehicles and they're tailored to what they want to do. The problem with something like a car is that you spend four hours a day either using it or earning the money to look after it, and it owns you. You're kind of enslaved by the thing. Uh, it's too much technology. Right? A bicycle, the only time you ever have to really worry about it is when you want to use it. And you have to give it some maintenance and care and attention and so forth. But um, you own it. It serves you. Uh, and that's a, a critical difference. Have you ever gone down in it? Yes, once. It was very sore. <laughs> As with bicycles, so Valentine collects people. Here, the designers and rider of potentially the fastest human-powered vehicle on Earth, the Beam. That's right, yeah. We're a bit short on the heel space, but uh, we're limited by the, the moulding. Certainly when I was trying the sprint attempt in Leicestershire in December, I was just using the... the... In one hour from a standing start, the Bean has clocked up nearly 47 miles, a world record. The lack of vehicle movement was quite remarkable. It was just, you know on the line, smooth, steady. Yeah. Next, an attempt on the 200-meter sprint. The bean itself is arguably the fastest HPV in the world today. It hasn't had a chance to prove it at high altitude. But it does seem to me now that we've had the totally substantial change of new materials and new capabilities. Uh, and that has really opened some doors. Materials like the carbon fiber fairing encasing Ballantyne's favorite recumbent. For him, the ideal commuting vehicle. Weatherproof, fast. The clean, green manmobile. In a sense, the bicycle itself uh, is its own best argument. If you just get a bike and try it, start going with the thing, and using it as it suits you, uh, it'll grow and it'll get better, and better, and better. The bicycle is a vehicle of dreams. The gentle wheeling of free spirits. In a car, you know, whoosh, the world is like video going by the window. On a bicycle, the speed of travel is on a human scale. You're going fast enough to get through the forest, but slow enough to see the trees. I think you're born with a killer instinct. But I still get the fun out of it. Well, sadistic sort of fun. It's gone from just being um, competition to an adventure. For me, cycling is, is uh, a vehicle for adventure. Keeps me fit and happy, and fit and happy means I'll play better flute. It's hard to put into a specific words. It's a combination of mechanical, spiritual, physical things, but uh, I, I just really love the bicycle.
Cycling in America is for fun. Just one in 40 bikes is used for commuting. The rest, if they're ridden at all, are for fitness, sport and play. And as with so much else American, leisure pedaling is catching on in Japan. This hugely popular centre near Tokyo celebrates every conceivable form of bicycling. Indulgence, these cyclists are hard to beat. Alaska's Iditta bike race. 200 mile trail. Most of it on foot. Sixty competitors from as far away as Puerto Rico and Germany. An outlay with airfares and double-tired mountain bikes, astronomic, compared with the cycling needs of a Chinese peasant. And to have the race snowed off after just 50 miles? It's unanimous opinion of everybody, everybody here that uh, we're done right now. I rode two miles total out of the whole 50 if you exclude the roads off Big Lake. For most of the world, this is cycling. In Asia alone, bicycles transport more people and goods than do all the cars on Earth. In emerging economies like Taiwan, the bike is yielding to scooters and cars. Bicycles are regarded as the transport of the poor. Some third world governments have banned bikes from cities to make them look less backward. But in China, the authorities recognized decades ago that bikes were the cheapest mass transit. There's been sustained investment in bicycle routes and low-cost machines for all. There are some 300 million bikes in China. People are subsidized to ride to work. Even so, the World Bank, in a 400-page study, failed to mention the bicycle. Although the bicycle is the primary means for people to get around in Chinese cities and in the countryside, the word bicycle didn't occur in this report. It spoke only of buses and trains, trucks and cars. Such is the world's preoccupation with the car. Globally, bikes outnumber cars two to one. And world car production is outpaced by the bicycle three to one. One of the greatest ironies in the 20th century has to be that societies have continued to pour such vast amounts of precious resources like land and clean air and petroleum into technology that most of the people in the world will never afford, which is the automobile. Worst offender is the U.S., with a hidden subsidy on each car of $3,000 a year. We practically pay our commuters to drive by car. Car drivers pay very, very little tax on the gasoline that they use, and this little tax doesn't reflect the damage done to the environment. They don't have to pay for the, the space that they take up in parking lots. We have so much free parking in this country that that's an additional incentive. Another concept is to actually make drivers pay for the use of road space, because drivers take such a disproportionate amount of space, particularly when they drive one person per vehicle. New York, where bicyclists are fighting back. They're active and articulate. As one put it, there's magic blending with traffic, traversing the city under your own power, a living, breathing alternative to the domination of the motor vehicle. But there's a price to pay. Where road space is shared with automobiles, cyclists get hurt. They may have forced the city to reverse a bike ban on New York's three main avenues, but that's cold comfort to this victim. The American urban cyclist, despised by motorists, ignored by the government. In Washington, there's just one person at the Department of Transportation with a brief for cycling. Unfortunately, we just didn't get funded by Congress. 
and it was not until just recently that we've gotten some funding to uh, go into our fiscal year 1991 budget to establish uh, a person to take care of the bicycle program. One official on a staff of 100,000 and the U.S. population at over 250 million. In America, we supposedly have 2.7 million people who use the bicycle as a, uh, as a regular form of transportation on a daily basis. I think that's pretty impressive. With less than half America's population, Japan had 7.2 million commuters bicycling daily in 1980. This metro interchange in suburban Washington typifies America's dilemma. Buses feed commuters to and from the station, slow and inflexible. It can be more convenient to drive to town. Cycle to the station and there are more problems. It's easier to park a car. As a result, the metro loses thousands of potential riders. We have a number of big parking garages that have been built near the station. We have this one here right at the station entrance. And yet the bicycle parking here at the station is quite deficient. And the access conditions for cyclists trying to, to bike to the station are very dangerous. Suburban Japan, says Michael Replogo, is the example America must follow. Since the 60s, when many people abandoned inefficient feeder buses, the Japanese have been cycling to the station in their millions. By the mid-70s, there was chaos. So many commuters were cluttering stations with their machines that the government had to legislate. Railways and private businesses were required to provide bicycle parks. Suburbanization in Japan hasn't meant building just park and ride lots and more highways everywhere. Instead, the Japanese have built giant guarded bicycle parking garages, some of which are computerized and very high tech, to store bicycles at the station. And this is a much more economical way to get people to public transport than by car or by feeder buses. Today, there are nearly 9,000 such parks accommodating 2.5 million bikes. And if machines go unclaimed, they're shipped to the third world. Of the developed nations, the Netherlands has most wholeheartedly embraced the bicycle. The Dutch government is trying to tax drivers out of their cars and onto bikes. In the 10 years up to 1985, it spent $230 million on bicycle parking and on bicycle roads. A network of direct, uninterrupted routes, just for the bike. Have they gone crazy in Holland? They must have been struck by one of the windmills. It all started on October the 13th, yes, on a Friday. The Dutch television was looking for 10 people who are willing to give up the comfort of driving their own car for exactly 100 days. Such is concern at car emissions and overcrowded roads that Dutch television runs game shows to get viewers to junk their cars. Unlucky participants watch stoically as their cars are dispatched. In compensation, they get a memento of the crushed vehicle and a mini bike to take home. So pervasive is the bicycle that it accounts for up to half of all trips in Dutch cities. But there's a downside, bicycle theft. This man is trying to sell a bicycle, undoubtedly stolen, and he needs the money for drugs. The buyer is a student whose bike was stolen earlier in the day. He scrapes together 15 guilders for a transaction that's illegal if you suspect the bike to be stolen. Thus is much of Amsterdam's drug trade financed. It's, it's like a circle. Uh, they, they, st they steal bikes and then uh, you need a bike but, and you buy a bike from somebody else. So uh, it's a vicious cir circle. So it's, uh, you could say it's a currency. Yes. Little wonder Dutch TV commercials remind you to lock your bike. No, think of your feet. Odense, Denmark. 
famous for Hans Christian Andersen and radical traffic engineering. A city restored to the people, where pedestrians and cyclists take precedence. Motor vehicles, if they're allowed at all, move with care and consideration. Odinsa has curbed the car and backed the bike. Cycle routes radiate to every suburb and beyond. We would be sitting right on the road here. We had uh, one-way traffic uh, around the whole town hall in two lanes and uh, there was a bus stop at this place and uh, it was a very, very noisy place and uh, not a place for pedestrians and cyclists uh, 20 years ago. Odinsa is Denmark's biggest success. But throughout the country, traffic calming is the vogue. From Norway, the Danes have imported the Emil philosophy, the environmentally adapted through road. For a small town on a main route, an alternative to a costly bypass. But you might, too, the Norwegians said, build, reconstruct the road as it is through the town, but taking the the pedestrians' needs and the cyclists' needs and the local community's needs as the primary factor. And that's the Emil philosophy. Pedestrians are moving much more freely, the cyclists are using the road in a quite new way, and the through traffic is just about the same as it has been all the time, only it's slower and takes more consideration towards the other road users. Motorist organizations have seen that membership will drop if they go too hard against uh, this uh, traffic calming. I think Scandinavia, um, for their purposes, should be commended for that. Our country is a little bit larger, it's a little bit more complex, if I may say so. So I think our, the bicycles will have to be accommodated uh, to our needs. America's needs continue to favor the car. Not just more highways, but new technology built into the car. There's something called a smart car, the Pathfinder, that will enable uh, each driver in a particular car that's equipped with a special sort of radar station that will uh, point out to the driver what are the free routes so that the driver has the opportunity to take a look at the map as he's driving on the freeways or the roadways, see which roads are congested and make the choice himself as to where next to go to find a less uh, uh, congested route. Meanwhile, cities like Tokyo, London and New York contend with pollution. Half the world's conurbations suffer harmful levels of carbon monoxide. A third have dangerous concentrations of lead. Exhaust emissions cause ill health, and they're blamed for global warming and reductions in crops like cotton and soya bean. Frustration abounds as traffic grinds ever more slowly. In Seattle, on America's northwest seaboard, congestion is so bad that the police have come up with their own pragmatic solution, the bicycle. Twenty-eight officers who've traded squad cars for mountain bikes. They can weave through gridlocks and sneak up silently on suspects, and arrests have risen dramatically. And with the bonus that the police are back in touch with the public. I think there's something real human about a policeman in shorts uh, and a bicycle helmet riding down the street on a bicycle. Uh, people that would never dream of speaking with a police officer in a car or on a motorcycle uh, wouldn't hesitate to come up and talk to us. We filmed two arrests with the bike squad. You see him, he's right at the North Hill right now. The suspect in white has a gun. The bicycle cops are taking no chances. Okay, we're on our way. Well, yeah, move in. No, he's still got it in his hand. Right where that gal stood up. A tense moment. For if the suspect fails to raise his hands, the bike bobbies will shoot. I got it. They got him. The suspect complies. A dangerous shootout in a busy park in downtown Seattle has been averted. An arrest that probably wouldn't have happened had the police been using cars. Next, a drug bust. This man is removing a sachet of drugs from his mouth. 
delivery. Again, all of it observed by the bicycle squad from a stakeout. Okay, we'll move in and uh, try to apprehend it. Seattle was first. Now, all over the world, city police are rediscovering the bike. And from Tokyo and Hong Kong to New York and London, bicycle couriers are peddling for profit. On your bike is London's biggest courier, and it's booming because the bicycle is the fastest way to get parcels across town. The same with Nosaka Express in Tokyo. With average traffic speed down to 8 kilometers an hour, the bicycle is like quicksilver. Couriers have emerged through commercial necessity, bike cops with a need for speed and mobility. It's an important message, straight from the streets. But governments and planners persist with bigger and better roads attracting more and more traffic. Today in the United States, there is one automobile for every two people. The nationwide highway system is our pride and joy. And it was a very far-sighted move on the part of President Eisenhower back in the 50s when he developed the national highway system. The bicycle in this country remains a recreational vehicle. It's something for the family, it's something for health and, and fun, and it's going to be pretty hard to wrestle those cars away from the American public. And likewise in Britain, where traffic congestion costs $24 billion a year. A 16-kilometer car commute burns up 18,600 calories of energy, well over two liters of gasoline. The same journey by bike needs 350 calories, the energy in a bowl of rice. But like so many of us, the Japanese remain at their steering wheels. They'll even pay a $2,000 registration fee for every two years of their car's life. Technological luxury stuck in a traffic jam. About 100 bicycles can be made with the same materials used to build a medium-sized car. In the perfect world of the bicycle advocate, this would be rush hour in Montreal. But it's not. It's a day of assertion by 40,000 cyclists. The goodwill is there. What governments must do is to find the way, the incentives to make the bicycle the mass vehicle for a small planet. It's a hundred years since the golden age of the bicycle. Given the problems of today, there's every reason for the bike to enjoy another golden age. Wouldn't that be something to shout about?